Okay. Hey, everybody, we're live. It is the it is live Q&A with the coach for March 3rd. We're back uh, after a little completely unintentional hiatus last week um, due to due to poor planning on my part. I think I talked about that a little bit. Um, I, I started going to a new, uh, not new, well, new to me, open mats in Seattle here. And it was a lot of fun. But uh, Sunday is also usually the day I do my laundry. And so my plan to get up super early, go do laundry, and then go to open mat didn't didn't quite pan out that way. So um, so I ended up missing <clears throat> missing missing this yesterday. Um, I, I'd, I'd actually meant to do it a little later, but I'll be honest, like I haven't done an open mat in a long time. So I was pretty fried. Um, was good rolls, you know, I rolled for about a half an hour, got five or six rounds in. Um, some folks were actually prepping for competition last weekend was, um, was Naga, I think it was, it was here. No, sorry. It was revolution, which, uh, which is actually the term I'm going to try and do in July. So I'm excited about that. And yeah, so, you know, poor, poor excuses, poor, I mean, completely poor excuses on my part. Um, but, uh, we're here now. I'm gonna, gonna just chat for a little bit until some folks pop on. If not, we'll, we'll get going here in a little bit, but, um, yeah, it's been a crazy week. Uh, you guys know if you've been following the AM Icebreakers, um, that's uh, on my YouTube channel, which I'll, I'll post a link to. You know, I was down in California last week for um, for work. You know, I, I fly down to the <clears throat> the Facebook office, Facebook headquarters in Menlo Park, uh, probably once a quarter. It, it's funny, my boss actually is down there, and so the team and the team I'm attached to is in Seattle. But you know, Facebook's got such a great. Um, such a great just overall infrastructure for that that it's very easy for me to to, to fly down there and, and it's cool you know I don't California the Bay Silicon Valley it's not somewhere I would ever live again but it's it's great to visit and especially SoCal you know I'm I'm glad that I have excuses to go down to Long Beach or you know the Newport Beach area Santa Monica and all the all the great gyms and all the great friends I've made through you know my my fitness journey you know like the folks down at uh, Innovative Results and of course you know the guy I always mentioned Tony Jeffries love you Tony. Um, Box and Burn Academy in Santa Monica. I think Brentwood, and I think they're opening a gym in West Hollywood too. Man, that guy, that, that guy, that guy doesn't ever sleep. You know, people think I don't sleep. That dude doesn't ever sleep. So um, yeah, so so that was cool, and I'll actually be flying back down there in, in two weeks. Yeah, two weeks. It'll it's the Game Developers Conference, and as I've mentioned, I'll be speaking there. So I'll be I'll be doing a, a talk at the Game Developers Conference on um, not. Not game development, actually. I'm going to be speaking about quality of life, which is kind of cool. Um, I'll be talking about, I'll be talking about basically, you know, software developers, people who work in tech. We we spend a lot of time seated, and we spend a lot of time in positions that aren't necessarily good for us. So, what I'm going to be talking about is some just some some day to day strategies that. Uh, that, that developers, you know, people who, and, and basically anybody who spends a lot of time at a seated, in a seated position for work or for whatever reason can use to sort of undo some of that damage. And the takeaway will be just a short little daily routines that people can do. And then some, some longer routines that people can do as actual movement, kind of movement medicine, I think is the term that people have started using now, which, uh, which I really like, you know, because it, because it makes sense. You know, I mean, like Paul Check says all the time, you know, that's, that's one of, one of, one of Paul Check's four doctors. And, um, so, yeah, so, <clears throat> so, uh, and I've mentioned a couple times for anybody who's actually going to be at the conference, if you would like a, what we call a movement screen and a movement screen is just a series of very simple movements that we kind of take you through to kind of see where you're at, see where things like your joint range of motion is, see how, how your tissue extensibility is, see how your motor control is. And then from there, if you want, we can develop a, a uh, kind of a movement program, sort of a, a correctives program for you to kind of help maybe speak to some of whatever issues you might be having we, that we that we notice. And and the reality is like we, we all have you know nowadays we all spend too much time sitting or we all spend uh, too much time exercising and not recovering or we all don't eat or and recover as well as we should. So we all have some kind of movement issue. And the point is just to, uh, that what we've learned over the last couple of years is that, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a, a sentence. It's not a, you know, it's, it's not a permanent, you know, as long as you're of able body. And even if you're not, you know, I mean, some of you are familiar with the idea of adaptive athletes, you know, there's, there's work that we can do to kind of get us back to um, back, at least re restore some of that joint, joint health and, and tissue health. And what's up, Ronnie. And uh, like, uh, you know, like, like my, like my, my mentor, Sarah says, 
um, you know, we, we're, we're born with, with great mobility. And then as adults, we have to re-earn that mobility. We have to re-earn those ranges of motion and strength because, you know, if, if you, and you've, ever, you've seen it, if you ever watch a, a toddler or a baby squat, they have mechanically perfect squats. Or if you, you, know, you watch how they roll or how they crawl, it's, it's, it's beautiful, you know, because, because we're born with all that range of motion. We're born with great joint health. We're born with great tissue extensibility. And then through accumulated stress, whether it's physical, emotional, mental, whatever, all these things come together and start to rob us of our ranges of motion and our joint health and our tissues. And of course, you know, if, if you're like me, you know, or, you know, if you're like, you know, you know my buddy Ronnie, what's up Ronnie again, you know, you, you, you spent a lot of years doing hard training, you know, that, that stuff adds up, you know, you spend a lot of time, you know, in sports, you spend a lot of time doing repetitive motions. Um, you know, I, I did powerlifting for years. So, and, and you guys know the joke about powerlifters, you know, we, we, we sit here like this because we're trying to either squat or, or bench. And so, and then, you know, I did, and from there I went to jujitsu. And of course the joke there is, you know, we spend all our time like this, you know, all closed up and then worse, you know, even worse, I have a software development job. So I spend my time like this. So basically, you know, and, and I'm, and I'm not unique, you know, I've met so many people who have, who have, who have very, very similar stories. And so it's, it's always fun to, to kind of think about how we can start to walk that back. And that, that's actually one of the big reasons I got into, rather than doing strength and conditioning, why I got into movement coaching and mobility work and correctives was that it resonated with me. You know, um, I didn't, I've always been about movement. Um, you know, even when I, when I got into personal, personal training, weightlifting years and years ago, it was it was for performance. It was to be better at, I think I've mentioned this, but it was to be better at martial arts. It was so that I could, it was so that I could, yeah, so I could basically, so I could be better at Kapawada, so I could be better at jujitsu. And seeing other people who were in similar places and, and understanding that, no, no, we can, we can, we can, well, I, don't, I don't like to use the word fix, that's a, that's a loaded power word, but we can, we can help you, I guess, is where I felt like, as a fitness professional, I wanted to go. I felt like, you know, I want to, I want to help people get out of pain. I want to help people get back to their lives, get back to doing the things they enjoy doing, or maybe more than that. I want to help people develop a foundational competence, uh, like physical competence level to try new things. I mean, you know, that's another thing I heard from people all the time. And, and, you know, I know, I know you've heard it, Ronnie. I know people hear it all the time. Like, Hey, uh, yeah, I want to do this thing, but I'm not, I'm not in shape. Well, I mean, on the one hand, some things, you know, you do them and you get in shape as you do them. But, but at the same time, I understand where that comes from. You know, I understand what the physical and the emotional blocks are because a lot of us just don't have that connection with our bodies anymore. A lot of us just don't have that connection to our physicality anymore. So we see people doing things and we think, oh, I can't, I, I couldn't do that. I just, I don't, I don't. And when, and when in reality, you probably could, you know, when in reality, it's less that, it's less that you need to get in shape and we, we just need to connect your, your mind and your body again. And that's, that's very simple. And that, there's an actual process behind that, you know, things like, you know, this is where we do things like activation and, you know, exercises, priming exercises, you know, high, what we call high neural demand exercises, you know, things that, that basically teach you to consciously activate parts of your, you know, I mean, Arnold said it best, put your mind in your muscles, you know, and the science now is starting to actually bear that out is that, you know, that, that, you know, when we talk about uh, fascia and connective tissue, for example, our connective tissue is interesting because it, it doesn't have a lot of, of, uh, of blood vessels in it. And so, so, so for years and years, this is why people thought, oh, well, you can't, you can't actually develop your connective tissue. But, but what we've learned is that your connective tissue is, is what we say, we say very highly innervated, which means there are a, there's a lot of nervous, you know, nervous connections and nervous tissue in your, in your connective tissue. So that's why when we do these activation drills, we, we build that connection because you know, if we think about how our connective tissue connects to our muscles, connects to our bones, and it's all a big continuum. And that, that's a conversation for another day. I could, I could talk to you guys about that for hours. And it's really, it's fascinating stuff. This is stuff that I picked up, uh, you know, from FRC and from the FMS. And the funny thing about a lot of this is it, it's very new. It's, you know, I was, I was talking to, again, I was talking to, to Sarah, my, my mentor, a little while back. And, and I was noticing, and I was noting that a lot of the movement 
continuing education movement based stuff that a lot of people are saying the same thing and the reality of that is all this movement stuff you, you know you think about sure the fms has been around you know, the functional movement system has been around for 20 for maybe 20 years i think which is not a lot i mean that's you know where where were you 20 i mean i, I still remember 20 years ago you know 19 what 1997 98 um, I was working at Costco, I think. <laughs> um, but uh, but FRC, for example, the, the functional range conditioning stuff that I do, that's that's maybe five or six years old, and that research is always changing. Um, interestingly enough, there's a, a thing that they talk about in that course. They say uh, force is the language of cells. The idea being that that if you think about how your 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 tissues are your tissues are structured um, when you apply force to say a muscle or a bone that force actually causes chemical reactions inside the cells and that's what that's what kind of i guess that's, that's what sort of stimulates the cells to develop and actually i think there i think it was a uc berkeley just last year actually um was able to i think it was electron microscope scan this and so they actually showed that yeah that your cells that, that when you um that, that when you apply a load or a force to your cells, it actually goes all the way. I mean, it translates all the way into the cell, into the, the, the core of your cell, you know, the genetic material inside of your cell. And that's why people say things like when you're exercising, you're actually, you're actually influencing the expression of your genetics. Uh, that's, that's something the FRC guys say too, that as a, as a personal trainer, you're not just, you're not just helping somebody build muscle. You're not just helping somebody get in better shape. You are helping somebody express their positive genetic traits. So, you know, that's not a, so, so how's that for a, for a bit of a, of a mind fuck, right? So pardon my French. So, so, so that's, that's something to think about, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty heavy. And, um, so then and that's what, like I said, I, I could talk about this movement stuff all day. I, I, I love, you know, I've been, I've been, I've really dive deep into it for the last three years and it's been a lot of fun and I'm getting ready to to finally go big you know, I think I'm launching my website next week finally so um so anyway so we're, we're we're about 12 minutes in so I'm actually gonna get to what we're gonna talking about what we're gonna talk about today but uh, first little little bit of announcements I mentioned GDC is coming up um so I'll, I'll I'll have a link to my talk for anybody who's gonna be on site or in San Francisco I think it's actually an open talk so I, I think you can you can get in if you have just the minimal pass so that's kind of cool um, mentioned this the other day too. I'm gonna, you know, probably after this, sometime tonight, I'll have a Twitch stream up, so I'll post a link to all that. And um, so today we were going to talk about dry fasting, and I'm actually, um, I'm actually in our what is this? Hour 16, hour 15 of another dry fast. After, after after the first dry fast I did, I liked it so much, and the the effects that I saw just from that first fast were so so pointed that I kind of decided that I was going to add it to just kind of like my my weekly my weekly routine. So now I do. I probably won't do a 72 hour fast again, except for maybe once a quarter. Um, not that it was just I just don't know. There's not enough research to say that doing that sort of fasting on a on a very very regular basis is that good for you or bad so so i'm kind of going off of the scant research that's out there and then just kind of how i feel you know because like everybody says at some point you have to kind of experiment on yourself you know you're your laboratory um and i know we hear it all the time that what, what was it uh the um the, the coach who has himself for a client has a has a, has a fool for a coach or a fool for a client or something. Now, I, I think that's true at the beginning, but like I said, at some point you have to start figuring out what works for you. Um, the qu question from Ronnie: What did I get out of the last one? That's a really good question. So first, there was a big mental, big big mental shift. Um, you know, we're, we're told a lot that oh my god, you know, you you can't go that long without water. You can't, you know, it's it's bad for you. Um, but it completely reframed a lot for me. I mean, I, I worked out all three days that, and, and it was, and it was good training. I, mean, I was in the gym for an hour every day doing, doing my FHT, you know, completely dry fasted, you know, no water, no, no external, you know, I didn't, you know, no external moisture of any kind. And that, that was very sobering, you know, the fact that like, and, and, and I'll be honest. Yeah. My numbers went down a little bit and, and we know that we know that, that dehydration does, you know, does affect performance. And I think, I think if, if you search, you can find actual percentage numbers, like for, for every N, N hours, you're dehydrated, your performance drops some percentage points. But, but again, you know, that's there, that varies. Um, so there was the mental shift. And then physically, you know, I, 
it, it's interesting because I do, you know, I do fast, other fasting and I, and I'm a big fan of, you know, ketogenic diets and, and we'll say targeted low carb approach. So I, I actually did lose a good chunk of, of, of weight. And because, you know, because I was, you know, I'd already been, you know, I'm pretty sure it wasn't water weight. I'm pretty sure it was actually like, you know, I mean, it was, it was, I'm pretty sure it was fat weight, you know, probably, and I'm hoping not a lot of muscle. Cause like I said, I was still training that stimulus was still there. So that was awesome. And I also, I also noticed that, um, I felt less inflamed. This one was weird because, um, I was sitting in the gym one day. I think, uh, I started my fast on a Saturday and I think I was sitting in the gym on Sunday and I noticed that I was just moving around a lot better. Like my joints were just moving way better. I mean, I just had not necessarily more range of motion, but it, it, it just felt like my joints were just smooth. Like it's like some, like somebody had gone and just buffed them up and added some, you know, dumped some oil and resurfaced on them. And, and I mean, all over my shoulders, my spine, my hips. And I, I am going to attribute that to probably some lessened inflammation um, and probably maybe the effects of the autophagy, you know, what, what they call autophagy, but I, but I can't say, I really can't say. And, um, and the funny thing is I'm noticing that now too. Um, you know, when I was in the gym yesterday, I noticed that I was, <clears throat> yeah, absolutely inflammation cut down, you know, like just, you know, just taking, you know, not, not taking food in, not taking water not taking in things that, would cause an inflammation response, you know, because, because when we, because, because I mean, when we eat stuff, you know, when, when, when we eat, when we train, we get some degree of inflammation. And if, and if we eat something that maybe we're not, either we're allergic to, or we're not, or that our, that our gut bacteria just isn't fans of, you know, we get some inflammation and, you know, drugs, whatever, I mean, whatever, you know, if you're, if you're on supplements, if you're on whatever, that could cause inflammation too. So, so not having, so cutting all of that out and letting your body go into that natural kind of, like I said, what they call autophagy, which is basically where, where your cells just kind of, your body just kind of cleans out all the dead cells and recycles kind of all the, the dead stuff inside, um, is probably, probably has something to do with that. Um, and, uh, on this, on this fast, actually, um, one of the things that I did change is that I take, I do, I do take in a little bit of moisture actually. So we're going to talk about that. I, I have like a mouthful of coffee just cause caffeine has, is good stuff. And, um, I, I don't know if caf, you know, there, there's some, there, there's, there's been some, some discussion on whether or not caffeine is the, and coffee are the big diuretics that we used to, hold on a second, that we used to think they are, but they're not necessarily. So I like to take coffee with my pills, got my, uh, on a TPC pack, so I'm going to take some, uh, some hot rocks. Yeah. Sponsor me on it. Sponsor me biotest. Although on, on it did send me a, a free box of their protein bars, which, uh, which, which I appreciate very much. Maybe, maybe I'll do a, I'll do a review of the, of them on, on this one of these times, but, uh, uh quit my drugs. And hopefully, um, hopefully you guys know about the benefits of caffeine and, and what it does. If not, I'll, um, well, even if you do, I'm going to post a great video that Thomas DeLauer put up about, the effects of caffeine on fat mobilization and, uh, and sugar mobilization. That'll be in the, the YouTube comments. And, um, but, uh, so, so I take, I, I have, you know, three shots of espresso twice a day, once in the morning to take my, my morning pills. And then once before I go work out and then, um, and again, you know, it's, it's less than eight ounces. It's probably about four ounces, four to six ounces of fluid. So, I mean, your body goes through that, like, you know, and you lose most of that. Um, so, so that's kind of what I've been doing. And uh, as far as why I, um, why I was so interested in dry fasting, because, because really it came out of nowhere. Um, uh, you know, I've mentioned Thomas DeLauer a few times. I'm a huge fan of Thomas DeLauer's videos. And I'll have a link to his channel, uh, in the comments too, because I think, I think everybody should check out what he's doing. But, uh, he posted a video on dry fasting a while back and, uh, I thought that that sounds really odd, but he made, you know, he made a lot of good points, brought up some, some, I'm actually going to say some sketchy research. You know, I read the research that he posted and I was like, eh, I don't know about that. But what he was, the way he interpreted it made sense to me. And, you know, you know, I love, I love learning new things. Um, I don't, I don't like being stagnant. You know I mean? You know, I mean, I think about just the stuff I've learned in the last three years, you know, what I knew about fitness and training when I started, you know, training people back in 2005, 2006 versus what I've learned in the last three years is night, not even night and day, but it's like 
Earth and another planet. So, um, so, so it's cool to like learn learn new things. I mean, this, you know, we we I think we've walked around it with this just fear of chronic dehydration. And and granted, chronic dehydration, like yeah, verified, it's bad for you. But it's like a lot of things. I think there's. I think I think it's it's kind of like fasting in general, right? There there's kind of levels and limits, and there there are quantifications we need to do. Like, what is chronic dehydration, right? So, so that's what interested me. So that was one of the things that interested about me because, like, I I love to learn when I'm learning new things. I also love learning that, hey, that thing we used to to think maybe it was wrong. You know, I, I love being wrong. I love kind of figuring out that oh, that's that you know yeah there, maybe there's a better way or maybe not a better way but a different way that might be better and but maybe isn't worse and that's the interesting thing about about dry fasting is that um is you know it it, it does kind of shock your body and we're not talking about like you know like say muscle confusion silliness you know right? it's it's well documented that, that your body does react to certain stressors you know i mean you've heard of heat and cold shock proteins i feel like a dry fast probably does something similar um, because just the way, you know, maybe your autophagy, you know, your, that, that cellular process is a little bit different. So, and, and I'll post some, some great videos of Andy Galpin and, and Rhonda Patrick talking about this stuff in, in the YouTube comments. Um, but again, that's a whole other conversation, which, which maybe we'll have someday. I mean, heat and cold shock proteins and heat and cold therapy, Wim Hof, all that stuff, you know, human optimization, I guess is as they're calling it nowadays. But, um, but yeah, and and it's funny because this whole thing with dry fasting, um, I think I've mentioned the carnivore diet uh, a little while back, and you know that was another thing that really just kind of like blew my mind. And so after seeing the success of that, and and also like just following Dr. Sean Baker's work and seeing that he wasn't afraid to posit things that maybe the mainstream is is kind of like saying, no, no, we know, we, we know this is true. For example, one of the videos he posted was, do we really need fruits and vegetables? And, and, and you see it everywhere. I mean, there was a, there was even a, a post on Instagram I saw the other day where somebody put up, it, it was an infographic and it had little, like, basically it was like, here are all the things that are common with all these diets and they all had vegetables in them. And so, and the, the uh, caption was, can we all agree that fruits and vegetables are good? Well, is that maybe correlational though? I mean, is it maybe just one of those, like, maybe that's all people had. So they, they ate fruits and vegetables and they saw good results because I mean, yeah, they're, they're probably not, I mean, they're obviously not bad for us, but are they essential? Right. And, and, and again, you can point to cultures that don't have vegetables. And I think the Inuit is one that we hear about all the time that just eat, you know, protein and fat because that's what they have. But when we do the epidemiology studies on them, we see that like they're as healthy as anybody. And it's the same with like vegetables. You know, the, the idea that maybe that we need fruits and vegetables is essential again just comes from these 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 studies that don't actually say they're essential. It just says they're not bad for us. So you know, again, same with dry fast. And I'll actually, I'll post some links to those videos too. Um, and Dr. Sean Baker's work is fascinating. I know, I know, Ronnie, you were talking about trying the carnivore diet. And like I said, I, I, I recommend it. Um, I had, I'm gonna. The only reason I'm not on it right now is because I think I eat too much. Uh, it's really easy for me to eat a lot, and I'm trying to, like, I'm trying to do my fight cut right now for July. So, um, but again, you know, it's it's that whole idea of why not try something new if somebody has mentioned that it's not bad? I mean, you know, you guys have heard this story before and all of the, um, how's the story go? Uh, you know, a guy's talking to his wife, watching her prepare Christmas dinner. She cuts the ends off of a ham. He says, why do you do that? And she said, oh, that's the way my mom did it. And so they go to her, they go to, you know, her mom, hey, 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 hey mom, 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 why do you cut the ends off a ham? Well, that's what my mother did. So they go to the grandmother and they ask her, hey, why do you cut the ends off the ham? And she says, well, because otherwise it wouldn't fit in my pan. You know, so we, we have to be really careful about stuff like that. Um, so anyway, so that, that, that's some background. Um, my, my fasting history, it, um, you know, I've been fasting for a long time on and off. Um, I actually started back in 2004. Uh, a guy named Ori Hoffmeckler, maybe you've heard of the warrior diet. And he, he advocated a very extreme, I think it was, it was a 20, it was a 20 hour fast and then four hours of, of just eating. And he even had specific things that you ate, you know, during that time you ate things like you know, fish, vegetables, 
you know, not not heavy food. Like, you know, he was not a big fan of red meat. He was not a big fan of pork or chicken. It was you know, vegetables, fish, seafood, um, some some grains, you know, brown rice, quinoa, that sort of stuff. And um, that actually, I had some good results for it. But it's funny, the reason it actually ended up working for me so was at the time I was working a lot. I was working a really crazy schedule. Yeah, Steven was doing that. It's, it's a good diet, man. It's um, if, if you can if you can kind of get into that sort of that, that rhythm, like I said, I really liked it. And especially if you're training, because that was the one thing I noticed from it is the training effect was amazing. I would go into training and just be able to just kill it, you know, and then I would go eat right after that, you know, so I, so, you know, it's like I'd train and then I'd have four hours of just, you know, just, just eating a decent amount of food. And, you know, I'd wake up the next day, felt really good. And, you know, I lost, I, I lost a bit of weight and I didn't put on any mass, but that's because probably because I wasn't eating that much. I mean, you know, you can only eat so much in four hours, right? Especially if you're trying to eat, eat uh, healthy, but seeing the kind of the success I had from that and also that it, that it actually wasn't that hard. I mean, mentally, physically, I mean, it took me about two weeks to really adapt. And after that, it was easy. And so I revisited fasting. I don't remember how long I did it for. I did it for a while, but I revisited fasting again in 2011. Uh, I was living down in Santa Monica and I met a guy who was really, who introduced me to this guy named Martin Birkin, who uh, maybe you've heard of Lean Gains. Um, I'll throw a link up to that. But Martin Birkin is the guy I think that's credited with kind of sort of the modern take on inter intermittent fasting, you know, the whole, the 16, eight thing, which, um, which I just saw that T nation kind of snaked, you know, no, no, you know, no, no offense, but shame on you, Paul Carter, like, you, you know, um, so, <clears throat> and, uh, and the 16-8 thing also I thought worked really well. That, that was interesting because, you know, you can play around with where your feeding windows are. You know, and I tried doing the the kind of the, the typical, you you know, you, you don't eat the whole morning and then you start eating in the afternoon and then you eat till the evening. And then I played around with you eat in the morning till, you know, afternoon or you eat, or you eat during the day. You know, you eat 9 to 5. You, know, you can eat breakfast, lunch, dinner on a fairly regular schedule. And that's an eight-hour feeding window. And, um same thing had um had a lot of good success with, with that so so when i saw the thomas delara video on dry fat and i've been doing that on and off for since then you know i mean there's usually when i don't have anything that i'm trying to train for specifically um i'll just do a 16 8 fast just because just because it's easy it's convenient <clears throat> and um and honestly i don't i don't love food like i'm not one of those people who like eat, I'm, I'm not i mean i'm not so like you know i'm not so hardcore it's like yeah food is fuel and I don't care, but I'm, but I'm also not with these people. It's like, yeah, food is an experience and I love it. And, you know, if you're either one of those, that's fine. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm just not that. So um, I just like to get in, get out, not have to think about it. Um, you know, if, if I weren't so freaked out about all the varying quality of protein shakes, I would probably just live off of that. But the problem is I hate, I hate protein shakes. I'm not a sweet things guy and that just kills me. So... Yeah, so that that's kind of that. So I'm gonna go ahead and just jump into the questions since uh wow, since I've been rambling for a while. But um the first question I got was from my buddy Brad, who um as I mentioned, uh, I'm doing a collab with with his company, Rigging Dojo, for uh, moving. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit going to GDC in a couple of weeks. But um his question is, and I think you kind of asked this too, Ronnie. His question is, what did you notice different, if anything, with your dry fast versus another fast? Uh, so that's the first question. Um, what I noticed different was actually, to be honest, um, hmm, what did I notice that was different? I, I noticed that I had less brain fog. I noticed that I was less like, I noticed I was way more alert. Um, you know, usually when I fast, I do like a normal, like a water where I'm still drinking water and, and, you know, just, you know still hydrating, just not eating, um. I notice I, I feel a little bloated. I feel just because I, I probably because I drink so much water. Um, not having that, um, I definitely felt like I said I felt like I was moving better. I felt more alert. Um, I, I just I, I don't know. It was really weird. Like I felt like my training even was better. So and I, I noticed that this time too. Like I mean, when I went to the gym yesterday, um, I mean I was yeah. I, I mean my numbers were. I actually moved some of my numbers up, which which I thought was kind of impressive. Um, so that's probably the big one. Like, like I mentioned earlier, you know, I felt less inflamed. I felt less bloated. I felt like I was moving better. I felt more mentally clear, higher, higher quality energy. Um, 
Uh, now, the second question that Brad asked is, is, uh, is my favorite one. He asked, uh, how was the recovery after doing it, in, if anything different after coming off the fast? So that's the part I screwed up. Um, I, I had a plan to come off of the fast, but I think because it was such an extreme fast. I mean, it was a full 72 hour, 72 hours plus dry fast. It actually ended up being closer to about 80 hours. And I was going to try and come off of it very slowly. So I was gonna say, first day back, I was just gonna drink water. Second day back, I was gonna add in some protein shakes. Third day third day back, I was gonna, that was not a good idea. Um, <laughs> if you're gonna do an extended fast, don't, don't come off of it like that. The day you come off your fast, break your fast right away. You know, have some bone broth, have a protein shake, have some fat coffee, whatever. But definitely, like, don't ease back into it. I think, I think, I think, you know, you, I think maybe I was probably at a point where my body was like, hey, you know, hook me up, and and I was just kind of teasing instead of like saying, all right, here, we'll just we'll just break the fast properly. So. So it's funny. I actually felt worse transitioning off of it than when I was on it, probably because you know, because I did it wrong. So like, so, so for example, this time, you know, tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up, you know, have some fat coffee, have breakfast and just see what happens. Um, yeah. So, so that I'll, I'll, I'll report back on that. So hopefully that works better. Uh, and then the other question I got, uh, this was our, a random question I got on Instagram for tips on, and I think you actually asked me this last time a little while ago, Ronnie, too, was how to how to kind of get into fasting and extend the length of your fasting. Um, and I, I would say um, so when I started fasting the very first time and anytime I do this, anytime I change my nutrition and my nutrition pattern, I have a plan to kind of transition. Um, I don't so much anymore, I think, because I'm so because I've gotten so used to fasting. I was gonna say I'm so good at fasting. What does that even mean? Um, but I'm so used to fasting that I don't need to do it. But I would say if you're new to fasting, you know, kind of ramp your calories down, you know, or ramp your macros down. For example, you know, maybe like you know, cut your carbs out and just do protein and fat, and then cut maybe cut just your fat out and just do just protein, and then. And the same with the, if you're going into a dry fast, you know, go from, you know, maybe from, I don't know, I'm just going to admit what a horrible person I am and say, go from like five cups of coffee to like, to one cup of coffee and some water, then go, then have just water and then, and then go dry. Um, so, <clears throat> but, but basically it's just, it's just take gradual steps. I mean, it's like anything, right? It's like when you, when you start training, you don't, you don't jump under the bar and try to, and, and try to PR like your first day, you know? So, and same with like, like increasing, you know, figure out a schedule that you think is going to work for you because, because, you know, you have to take into account like how your body works. You know, if, if, if say one day you say you've never fasted before and one day you, you try like a 16, eight afternoon fast and the next day you try a morning fast your body's gonna freak out your body's gonna be like wait what are you doing like you know like let me let me adapt first and then we can then then you can start changing things again so find a schedule that you think you can stick to and then you know start maybe with 12 hours then move it to 13 and move to 16 and then if you want to do a full 24 um so yeah that's that um Anyway, uh, so I am going to jet. I think I'm a little over. I've got a ton of stuff to do. Got some Viking Ninja posters to finish. Viking Ninja promo info because uh, we've still got a ton of workshops coming up. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, like I said, I'm going to do a, tw a Twitch stream at some point tonight. So uh, follow me there. I'll throw a link up to that on YouTube. Um, and I got to finish my website because, like I said, I'm launching my website this weekend. So that'll be awesome. So um, yeah, man. 1410 regularly there you go man so so now it's, it's just a just a quick jump to 168 and you're good so yeah 1410 is is a good um 1410 is a good way to ease into it i know i know there's the research shows that there's probably not a huge difference between 1410 and 168 so it's at that point you can sort of find one that works for you um, you know, if, if you find that like 1410 is, is just as good or better than a 16.8, you know, like I said, the research says stay with a 1410, you know, um, but, you know, especially if you're, if you're, if you're somebody who sleeps a lot, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, if you're not awake for all that time, your body's still in that kind of that recovery state. Um, I, I'll see if I can find that paper. That was a, that was a really interesting report. I think it was on, I think Alan Aragon posted it, but, um, but yeah, um, 
thanks for hanging out, everybody. And uh, probably do this next weekend. And peace.